Chapter 3 of The Best Christmas Pageant Ever Written by Barbara Robbins Pictures by Judith Gwynne Brown Mrs. Armstrong, who was still trying to run things from her hospital bed, said that the same people always got the main part. But it's important to give everybody a chance, she told Mother over the telephone. Let me tell you what I do. Mother sighed and turned the heat off under the pork chops. All right, Helen, she said. Mrs. Armstrong called Mother at least every other day, and she always called at supper time. Don't let me interrupt your supper, she always said, and then went right ahead and did it anyway, while my father paced up and down the hall, saying things under his breath about Mrs. Armstrong. Here's what I do. Mrs. Armstrong said. I get them all together and tell them about the rehearsals and that they must be on time and pay close attention. Then I tell them that the main parts are Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the angel of the Lord. Then I always remind them there are no small parts, only small actors. Do they understand what that means? Mother asked. Oh, yes, Mrs. Armstrong said. Later, Mother asked me if I knew what that meant about small parts and small actors. I didn't really know. None of us did. It was just something Mrs. Armstrong always said. I guess it means that the short kids have to be in the front row of the angel choir, or else nobody can see them. I thought so, Mother said. It doesn't mean that at all. It really means that every single person in the pageant is just as important as every other person, that the littlest baby angel is just as important as Mary. Go and tell that to Alice Wendelkin, I said, and Mother told me not to be so fresh. She didn't get very mad, though, because she knew I was right. You could have a Christmas pageant without any baby angels, but you couldn't have one without Mary. Mrs. Armstrong knew it, too. I always start with Mary, she told Mother over the telephone. I tell them that we must choose our Mary carefully, because Mary was the mother of Jesus. I know that, Mother said, wanting to get rid of the telephone and cook the pork chops. Yes, I tell them that our Mary should be a cheerful, happy little girl, who is unselfish and kind to others. Then I tell them about Joseph, that he was God's choice to be Jesus' father, and our Joseph ought to be a little boy. She went on and on and got as far as the second wise man when Mother said, Helen, I'll have to go now. There's somebody at the door. Actually, there was somebody at the door. It was my father, standing out on the porch in his coat and hat, leaning on the doorbell. When Mother let him in, he took off his hat and bowed to her. Lady, can you give me some supper? I haven't had a square meal in three days. Oh, for goodness sake, Mother said, come on in. What would the neighbors think to see you standing out there ringing your own doorbell? And why didn't you ring the doorbell ten minutes ago? Mrs. Armstrong called Mother two more times that week to tell her that people could hem up costumes but couldn't cut them, and to tell her not to let the angel choir wear lipstick. And by Sunday, Mother was already sick of the whole thing. After church, we all filed into the back seven pews along with two or three Sunday school teachers who were supposed to keep everybody quiet. It was a terrible time to try to keep everybody quiet. All the little kids were tired and all the big kids were hungry and all the mothers wanted to go home and cook dinner and all the fathers wanted to go home and watch the football game on TV. Now this isn't going to take very long, Mother told us. My father had said it better not take very long because he wanted to watch the football game too. He also wanted to eat, he said. He hadn't had a decent meal all week. 
"First I'm going to tell you about the rehearsals," Mother said. "We'll have our rehearsals on Wednesdays at 6:30. We're only going to have five rehearsals, so you must all try to be present at every one." "What if we get sick?" asked the little kid in the front pew. "You won't get sick," Mother told him, which was exactly what she told Charlie that morning when Charlie said he didn't want to be a shepherd and would be sick to his stomach if she made him be one. "Now, you little children in the cradle room and the primary class, you will be our angels," Mother said. "You'll like that, won't you?" They all said yes. What else could they say? The older boys and girls will be shepherds and guests at the inn and members of the choir. Mother was really zipping along, and I thought how mad Mrs. Armstrong would be about all the things Mother was leaving out. And we need Mary and Joseph, the three wise men, and the angel of the Lord. They aren't hard parts, but they are very important parts. So those people must absolutely come to. Every rehearsal. What if they get sick? It was the same little kid, and it made you wonder what kind of little kid he was to be so interested in sickness. They won't get sick either, Mother said, looking a little cross. Now we all know what kind of person Mary was. She was quiet and gentle and kind, and the little girl who plays Mary should try to be that kind of person. I know that many of you would like to be Mary in our pageant, but of course we can only have one Mary. So I'll ask for volunteers, and then we'll all decide together which girl should get the part. That's pretty safe to say, since the only person who ever raised her hand was Alex Wendelkin. But Alice just sat there, chewing on a piece of her hair and looking down at the floor. And the only person who raised her hand this time was Imogene Herdman. Do you have a question, Imogene? Mother asked. I guess that was the only reason she could think of for Imogene to have her hand up. No, said Imogene. I want to be Mary. She looked back over her shoulder. And Ralph wants to be Joseph. Yeah, Ralph said. Mother just stared at them. It was like a detective movie when the nice little old gray-haired lady sticks a gun in the bank window and says, "Give me all your money," and you can't believe it. Mother couldn't believe this. Well, she said after a minute, "We want to be sure that everyone has a chance. Does anyone else want to volunteer for Joseph?" No one did. No one ever did. Especially not Elmer Hopkins, but he couldn't do anything about it because he was the minister's son. One year he didn't volunteer to be Joseph, and neither did anyone else. And afterward, I heard Reverend Hopkins talking to Elmer out in the hall. "You're going to be Joseph," Reverend Hopkins said. "That's it." "I don't want to be Joseph," Elmer told him. I'm too big, and I feel dumb up there, and all the little kids give me a pain in the neck. I can understand that," Reverend Hopkins said. "I can even sympathize. But till somebody else volunteers for Joseph, you're stuck with it. Nobody's ever going to do that," Elmer said. "I even offered Grady Baker fifty cents to be Joseph, and he wouldn't do it." I'm gonna have to be Joseph for the rest of my life. Cheer up, Reverend Hopkins told him. Maybe somebody will turn up. I'll bet he didn't think that somebody would be Ralph Herdman. All right, Mother said. Ralph will be our Joseph. Now, does anyone else want to volunteer for Mary? Mother looked all around, trying to catch somebody's eye. Anybody's eye, Janet, Roberta, Alice. Don't you want to volunteer this year? No, Alice said, so low you could hardly hear her. I don't want to. Nobody volunteered to be wise men either, except Leroy Claude and Ollie Herdman. So there was my mother, stuck with the Christmas pageant 
full of herdmans in the main rolls. There was one herdman left over and one main roll left over. And you didn't have to be very smart to figure out that Gladys was going to be the angel of the Lord. What I have to do, Gladys wanted to know. The angel of the Lord was the one who brought the good news to the shepherds, Mother said. Right away, all the shepherds began to wiggle around in their seats, figuring that any good news Gladys brought them would come with a smack in the teeth. Charlie's friend, Hobie Carmichael, raised his hand and said, I can't be a shepherd. We're going to Philadelphia. Why didn't you say so before, Mother asked. I, I forgot. Another kid said, My mother what doesn't want me to be a shepherd. Why not? Mother asked. I don't know. She just said don't be a shepherd. One kid was honest. Gladys Herdman hits too hard, he said. Why, Gladys isn't going to hit anybody, Mother said. What an idea. The angel just visits the shepherds in the fields and tells them Jesus is born. And handsome, said the kid. Of course he was right. You could just picture Gladys whamming shepherds left and right. But Mother said that was perfectly ridiculous. I don't want to hear another word about it, she said. No shepherds may quit. Or get sick, she added, before the kid in the front pew could ask. While everybody was leaving, Mother grabbed Alice Wendell came by the arm and said, Alice, why in the world didn't you raise your hand to be Mary? I don't know, Alice said, looking mad. But I knew. I'd heard Imogene Herdman telling Alice what would happen to her if she dared to volunteer. All the ordinary, everyday Herdman things like clonking you on the head and drawing pictures all over your homework and putting worms in your coat pocket. I don't care, Alice told her. I don't care what you do. I'm always Mary in the pageant. And next spring, Imogene went on, squinching up her eyes, when the pussy willows come out, I'll stick a pussy willow so far down your ear that nobody can reach it. And it'll sprout there, and it'll grow and grow. You'll spend the rest of your life with a pussy willow bush growing out of your ear. I had to admire Imogene. That was the worst thing any of them had ever thought up to do. Of course, some people might not think that could happen, but it could. Only Herdman did it once. He got this terrible earache in school. And when the nurse looked down his ear with her little lighted tube, she la yelled so loud you could hear her all the way down the hall. He's got something growing down there, she hollered. They had to take Ollie to the hospital and put him under and dig this sprouted pussy willow out of his ear. So that was why Alice kept her mouth shut about being married. You know she wouldn't do all those things she said, I told Alice as we walked home. Yes, she would. Alice said, Herdman's will do anything, but your mother should have told them no. Somebody should put Imogene out of the pageant, and all the rest of them too. They'll do something terrible and ruin the whole thing. I thought she was probably right, and so did lots of other people. For two or three days, all anybody could talk about was the Herdman's being Mary and Joseph and all. Mr. Mrs. Homer McCarthy called mother to say, that she had been thinking and thinking about it. And if the Herdmans wanted to participate in our Christmas celebration, why didn't we let them hand out the programs at the door? We don't have programs for the Christmas pageant, Mother said. Well, maybe we ought to get some printed and put the Herdmans in charge of that. Alice's mother told the ladies' aid that it was sacrilegious to let Imogene Herdman be Mary. Somebody we never heard of called up Mother on the telephone and said her name was Hazelback and that she lived on Spurl Hill. And was it true that Imogene Herdman was going to be Mary, the mother of Jesus, in a church play? Yes, Mother said. Imogene is going to be Mary in our Christmas pageant. And the rest of them, too? the lady asked. Yes, Ralph is going to be Joseph and the others are the wise men and the angel of the Lord. You must be crazy! 
said Mrs. Hazelbeck. I live next door to that outfit with their yelling and screaming and their insane cat in their garage door going up and down, up and down all day long. And let me tell you, you're in for a rowdy time. Some people said it wasn't fair for the whole family who didn't even go to church to barge in and take over the pageant. My father said somebody better lock up the Women's Society Silver Service. But Mother just said she would rather be in the hospital with Mrs. Armstrong. But then the flower committee took a potted geranium to Mrs. Armstrong and told her what was going on. She nearly fell out of bed, traction bars and all. I feel personally responsible, she said. What happens, I accept the blame. If I'd been up and around and doing my duty, this never would have happened. And that made my mother so mad she couldn't see straight. If she'd been up and around, it wouldn't have happened, Mother said. That woman! She must be surprised that the sun is still getting up every morning without her to supervise the sunrise. Well, let me tell you. Don't tell me, said Father. I'm on your side. Oh, I just mean that Helen Armstrong is not the only woman alive who can run a Christmas pageant. Up until now, I'd made up my mind just to do the best I could under the circumstances. But now... She stabbed a meat fork into the pot roast. I'm going to make this the best Christmas pageant anybody ever saw, and I am going to do it with Herkman's too. After all, they raised their hands and nobody else did, and that's that. It was too. For one thing, nobody else wanted to take over the pageant with or without Herkman's. For another thing, Reverend Hopkins got fed up with all the complaints and told everybody where to get off. Of course, he didn't say, go jump in a lake, Mrs. Wendelkin, or anything like that. He just reminded everybody that when Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, Jesus meant all the little children, including Herdman's. So that shut everybody up, even Alice's mother. And the next Wednesday, we started rehearsals.